Uh, so this evening, what I want to do is I want to kind of take a little bit of a different trek and talk a little bit about the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues. It's a, it's a wonderful gift. It's a weird and wonderful gift, right? You walk into a room and you hear a whole bunch of people doing uh, what seems like, which has the appearance of babbling, and, and you can look at them and see that they are making some sort of connection with God, and you can, you can see that when somebody is speaking in tongues, that they are they are being blessed in some way. There's, there's some sort of edification that comes with the gift of tongues. And, and I want to talk a little bit about that. And it's no secret, right? It's no secret. The other part of the reason I want to talk about tongues is we've kind of seen a little bit of an uptick in the gift of tongues in our church. Amen. Is that not a good thing? That is a great thing. Praise the Lord. Now, we had uh, two instances, two instances relatively recently, uh, where we had somebody speak out in a tongue and there was no interpretation. And uh, I know that kind of caused a little bit of angst, and so I want to talk about that just a little bit, uh, like what we do in those situations, why maybe that occurred. Uh, I also want to kind of give a general overview uh, of the gift of tongues and why we have it, Uh, maybe give you some scriptural backing, because everything that we do in the church today ought to have some sort of scriptural backing. Right, if we're going to come up with a statement of faith about the gift of tongues, right, the last thing we want to put in there is, well, I feel like the, the gift of tongues makes me feel good. You know what? Praise the Lord. Does not the gift of tongues make you feel good? Amen. That's the edification of the gift of tongues. But here's what we don't want to do with the feel good. We don't want to base doctrine off what makes us feel good. Because let me tell you something, as somebody who is all too familiar with the world of sin, I know that there are certain sins, sin generally, okay, makes you feel good, okay? So we don't want to necessarily uh, base any doctrine off what makes you feel good, okay? Feeling good is good when it comes from the Holy Spirit, uh, when it comes from a worldly source. Well, let's, let's really question that. All right, so that's part of what we'll also do tonight is we will, we will take the gift of tongues, this doctrine of tongues, and we will place it squarely within the scripture so that we can walk away today with a scriptural basis for why we believe the gift of tongues and what we believe about it. All right, so with that being said, let's, let's pray before we get into the message. I will pray in English and not in tongues um, because I don't want to have to interpret. So let's pray and we'll get into our message. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this wonderful gift, Lord. I know that others outside the church, they look at it and think it's wacky. Um, But Lord, you know, there are other wacky things that happen in the Bible, Lord, that you ordered. And we know that there are strange things that you do, and yet it still edifies the church. And so, Lord, we pray today, Lord, as we go over this gift of tongues, the beauty in this gift, Lord, the, the edification of this gift and the edification it provides the body when interpreted, Lord, we pray that you would um, bless us our minds and our hearts as we study this doctrine very closely today. We pray, Lord, that you would have it enter our hearts and minds, Lord, and for those of us who have the gift of tongues, Lord, encourage us to use it, Lord. Encourage us to pray in our private prayer closets in this gift that you've given us, Lord. And Lord, if there's a word that you want to give to us in a tongue, Lord, we pray that your unction would be strong upon us to speak it when needed. We pray also for the interpretation of you so called for. Lord, bless these words today as we speak them, and may it go into our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm kind of giving you a theological dissertation in my prayer there. That was not intentional. (laughs) All right, so I'm going to start. uh, We'll start taking a look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, verses 7 to 11. This should be a familiar passage of Scripture to many of us. We are in a Pentecostal church, and Pentecostal was marked by the gift of tongues and uh, became marked by spiritual gifts. And the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, writes to the Corinthian church, in chapter 12, verse 7 to 11, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. That's the key, each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, and this is the key, as he wills, as he wills. It's not something that we just, we give ourselves. We don't give ourselves the gift of the Spirit. It doesn't work that way. 
Or you ever come to like a, a birthday or a Christmas and it's your, you, it, it's your birthday maybe and so you go to the store and you buy yourself a gift because you can do that? Well, you can't do that with the gifts of the Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit has to give you the gift. If the Holy Spirit doesn't give you the gift, man, something else would have given you that gift and we don't want to talk about that. Uh, so the Holy Spirit is the one who gifts the gifts as he wills. And this is really important when talking, especially with those who might deny the gifts of the Spirit working for today. Uh, oftentimes you'll hear such a denial say something like, well, if you have the gift of healing, why don't you just go empty the hospitals? Just just go and empty the hospitals. And, and of course, I think this is such a great argument. Ha ha, got you, continuationist. You're, gonna, you're, you're done now. We know that the gifts of the Spirit aren't for today. And then, but the, the easy response is, well, you've got to read to the end of the verse. And the end of the verse says that the gifts are given as the Holy Spirit wills. Now, if, if the Holy Spirit should will that somebody walk into the hospital and pray for all the sick and all the sick get healed, then praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But the gift of healing is not in the person who is praying for the healing. The gift of healing is in the Holy Spirit who uses that through the individual. Very important distinction. And this is the same thing with the gift, the gift of tongues. Okay, so the gifts are here. The gifts are specifically given to the church for the building up of the church, the edification of the church. Right again, at the very beginning of our passage, it says, uh, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For the profit of all. Again, the spiritual gifts are not meant to be hoarded into yourself because perhaps they make you feel really good. But the spiritual gifts are used are used in conjunction with the Holy Spirit for the profit of all. If you got a gift of teaching, man, you better be using that gift of teaching. If you have a word of knowledge and the Holy Spirit is giving you that unction, I love that word, unction. He's, he, if he gives you that unction, don't hide it to yourself. No, share that word with others because that's what the gifts are for. And man, if you mess up and you give a word that is just not good or something and it just falls flat, you know what? Praise the Lord, you stepped out. Maybe you missed it this time, but you know what? We will, we will pray with you and the Lord will use you and he will cause something to happen. Amen. Don't be scared. We don't want to, we don't want to quench or quench the spirit. And I think sometimes... I think sometimes what happens with the gifts of the Spirit is, is if something falls flat, right, sometimes we can, we can get to the point where we're sort of judging that and saying, well, you know, that, that must mean that the Holy Spirit's not with that person, and, and you know, that's, that we, we shouldn't be letting them do. And you want to be careful with that. Why? Because what that does is it puts a fear in us. It puts a fear in us that if we get it wrong, uh, then we're going to be ostracized by our church community. Now, we don't want to be a church community that's ostracizing people. Um, so we need to have grace as we operate in the gifts of the Spirit. So, again, coming back specifically to the gift of tongues, let's do a little bit of a survey. Um, so if we take a look at the, uh, the gift of tongues in the book of Acts, it's, it's super interesting. Um, so the first place that we see this happen is actually in Acts chapter 2. Um, again, we're all familiar with the passage, but I want to read it anyway because, you know, it's the Word of God and it has power. Listen to this. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance as the Spirit gave them utterance. See, what's happening here is the Holy Spirit is working in these people, giving them syllables to say, and they speak them. And then listen, listen to the response after they speak them. It says, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Let's just stop for a second. Confusion is of the devil. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's be careful here. Let's be careful here. It depends on the kind of confusion. The kind of confusion that was happening here was that God was doing a mighty work and the people just could not wrap their heads around what was going on. 
says they were confused because they heard everyone speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled. If this confusion was followed by amazement and marveling, and they were saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which, they, in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and the Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. That is a long list of languages. And I think it's a long list of languages on purpose. On purpose. Because God is not bound by languages. See, what was, what was done, what was done at the Tower of Babel, Okay, what was done at the Tower of Babel was undone for the sake of the gospel. That the Holy Spirit would no longer make language a barrier to hearing the gospel and hearing the mighty works of God. So there's a sense in which every time we pray or speak in a tongue, there's this sense of proclamation that we are making that the gospel is for all humanity. That the gospel is for everyone regardless of nation uh, language, um, history, whatever you want to call it. It's for every individual who will come and call upon the name of the Lord. Every time you speak or pray in a tongue, it's almost as if that's the proclamation you're making. Such a beautiful, beautiful gift. But it goes on to say, of those who heard this, who were confused and then amazed. It says, we hear them speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful works of of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said, they are full of new wine. Isn't that so funny? Something that happened 2,000 years ago plays out exactly the same today, right? Right? You got people who, who hear people praying and speaking in tongue, and they, they see the fruit of someone enjoying this sweet presence of the Lord in this gift that is so given to us. And, and some are amazed by it, and they just want that gift just as much. And then others, right, they mock, and they say, well, they're crazy, or they, they've had a little bit too much to drink, or they're possessed. It's, it's funny how that continues uh, to today. This exact same thing that happened in the early church continues to today. But we know, and we rest assured, that the Scripture tells us that the gift of tongues is for us today. Now, I want to come down to Acts 10, 44, 46. There's going to be lots of Scripture today. It says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word he was preaching to them. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also for what? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then Peter said, he goes on to say a few other things. But this is the key here, right? They knew something had happened because they saw the Holy Spirit fall on them. And what was the sign? That they spoke with tongues and magnify God. They spoke with tongues and magnify God. Now, now here's the thing, right? Is if you come, if you come back to our original um, our original passage in Acts, it says that they all heard them in their own language, proclaiming the wonderful works of God. Our passage here um, has a very interesting way of saying this. It says, they spoke with tongues and magnified God. There's a funny little grammatical ambiguity here, and it's hard to tell, uh, even based on the context, whether the tongues that they were speaking was the vehicle with which they were magnifying God, uh, or, or were they, were they, were they speaking in tongues and also magnifying God in their own language? I, I don't have an answer for that, but what we do know, what we do know is that both things occurred. And we do know that those who speak in a tongue could be magnifying God in that spoken tongue. That could be what the spoken tongue contains here. But again, the thread between this passage and the one earlier in Acts is this, that when they spoke in a tongue, people understood it. It did not require an interpretation. It did not require an interpreter or a translator, as some say. The Holy Spirit gifted them with the gift of tongues as a language that is spoken, that these people heard and understood. Again, we come down to another example in Acts 19, verses 1 to 7, and it happened. <laughs> While Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, 
Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And so they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? And so they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and listen, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 and also 12 men, 12 men received the Holy Spirit. And the outward sign that they had received it was that they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Now, again, we have the same sort of thing going on here, that weird grammatical ambiguity. So we don't know whether people spoke in tongues and, and, and prophesied, and then when they prophesied, it was actually the tongue speaking that was the prophecy, or, or if they spoke in tongues and then they came back over to the original language, or maybe some others were prophesying, right, loudly in their, in their own language. It's hard to say specifically, given the grammatical ambiguity there, but when you take the other passages in mind, very well could be that when they were speaking in tongues, while they were extolling God in the first passage, and while there was this um, idea in the second passage that they were magnifying God, it could very well be that their tongue speak was a prophecy in tongues. And this is kind of the truth of the matter, is when we, when we look at the gift of tongues, when we're talking about speaking in a tongue, we'll, we'll make a uh, distinction between speaking and praying in a tongue later. But when we talk about speaking out in a tongue, right, the content of a translated tongue will be a prophecy. It's a prophecy. The content of a, of a translated or interpreted tongue is a prophecy. We'll just hold that in our minds uh, until we get to our passage in 1 Corinthians 14. Um, but yeah, so there are two places in Acts where the Holy Spirit fell upon individuals, um, but it does not explicitly say that they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I'll give you two. Uh, one, um, I'll just tell you what it is. I'll read the second one, though, but the first one was when Paul, Paul kind of got knocked off his horse, so to speak, right? Paul, Paul, it's hard to kick against the goats. Lord, is that you? Lord, is that you? Some translations say, sir, is that you? Okay, that's, that's a silly translation. Lord, is that you? Lord, is that you? He gets up and then he goes off to see, uh, I believe it's Cornelius, and some things happen. And he receives the Holy Spirit somewhere in there. I don't think the passage is very explicit, but Paul, when he revisits what happened later, talks about how he received the Holy Spirit. Now, did he speak in tongues? I don't know. It's not explicit. But what is explicit is if you pop over to 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says something like, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. So Paul is speaking in tongues, and he received that from somewhere. And if Paul is speaking in tongues, and he's, he's telling us to not forbid to speak in tongues, we know that he received it from the Holy Spirit. We go back to our passage in 1 Corinthians 12. That it's the Holy Spirit who gives the gifts of the Spirit. And here's the other passage in Acts 8, uh, 14 to 18. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria <coughs> had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit, they received the Holy Spirit. Now, it's important to recognize that it doesn't explicitly tell us that when they received the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. Listen to this, though. And when Simon, this is Simon the sorcerer, saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Okay, bad move. Bad move. We were watching Hook the other day. You know, bad form. <laughs> okay, bad form. You cannot buy the gift of God with money. And this is, this is the whole point of that passage. Is, is Simon of Cyrene was, was chided by the apostles because he did wickedly in the eyes of the Lord there by asking for this power with money. You can't do that. But that's beside the point. The question is, right, when it says that the, the Samaritans, it says that they received the Holy Spirit, what did Simon the sorcerer see? What did he see? It doesn't explicitly say, but he saw something happened that made him want to offer money for this great power that he thought he saw. What did he see? I suggest, okay, I'm just suggesting it's not explicit so we don't make an entire doctrine off this passage, but I think he probably saw them speak in tongues. 
He probably saw them speak in tongues and he probably saw them prophesy. As everywhere else that we see the Holy Spirit fall in this manner, it is accompanied by tongues and prophecy or tongues and magnifying God or some other thing. So, tongues is a thing. Tongues is a thing we see in Acts, but it's a little bit different. Okay, so there is no record of an interpreter in either any of these passages in the book of Acts. Now, you could say those who heard it in their own language, well, they, they're the interpreter. But that's not what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 14 when he talks about the necessity of a, of a tongue needing an interpreter. See, it just says that they understood in their own language. There was no need of an interpreter because they spoke in a language that they understood. There was no need for an interpreter. So every time we see this happen in the book of Acts, the key thing is, uh, two key things is, one, is that the tongues that were spoken in the book of Acts were known languages in the world that people could understand. They were known languages and people did understand them. And then the second key with these passages in Acts is that uh, they did not need an interpreter. There was no interpreter present. Okay, now there's a third thing, I wouldn't call it a key, but you understand that what's happening here is when the Holy Spirit is falling on these people in Acts, it's not in the local assembly. It's not in the local assembly. It's never in the local assembly in the book of Acts. You never, it's never an explicit reference to the Holy Spirit falling on somebody in the context of a, of a local assembly. It's always just so-and-so, Paul meets up with these individuals here, or Cornelius there, or whoever there. They just, it just kind of like organically happens. They're just like hanging out. It's like, hey, how's it going? Did you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? No, we didn't even know there was such thing as a Holy Spirit. Well, let's pray. Okay, this, this is what's going on. It's just very organic. It's not, it's not very formal. I know we're used to formalizing things in the gospel, and I think there's a place for that. But not everything has to be so, so formal and regimented. But the question then is, okay, well, what is tongues? What is tongues? So I've got two types of tongues. And we've been talking the first half of this message about the first type of tongues. That's the type of tongues that's a spoken language um, that people can understand without an interpreter. There is no need of a spiritual gift of interpretation with those kind of tongues because people understand them. They're actual languages spoken out for someone to hear, actual human languages. But then the second type of tongues, okay, we, we've often heard of it as uh, being called gibberish. I don't particularly like the term gibberish because it's, uh, uh, it's a little bit condescending. You know, oh, you guys just speak in gibberish. No, 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 it's not gibberish. It's more than that. Gibberish implies a uselessness, a vanity to it. But there is no vanity or uselessness to the gift of tongues. So I would say ecstatic speech is probably the better option. I know we've, we, we use the term tongues of angels. I do not particularly like the term tongues of angels because there's an implication in there that this is an angelic language of which we don't see any scriptural support for that at all, with the exception of maybe, maybe 1 Corinthians 13.1, when, when it says, uh, um, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. Okay, maybe, maybe that could be it. But it's, it, it's so far removed from the point that Paul is making from that passage that I would really question whether we should use that to call this gift the tongues of angels. So I, I shy away from using the term tongues of angels. Um, we could use the scientific term, right? If you want to get all sciencey. Or you call it glossolalia, right? That's actually a Greek, Greek phrases uh, bunched together. Glossa meaning tongue and lalia meaning speak, to speak, right? Tongue speaking. <laughs> However, that's pretty sterile. I don't particularly like glossolalia, right? Ecstatic speech, I think, works a little bit better because it gets to the point. Because it's speech that we speak when we don't even know what we are saying. It's speech that we speak when we don't even know what we are saying. And here's the thing about ecstatic speech. If ecstatic speech, glossolalia, tongue speak, whatever you want to call it, if it's going to be spoken in the local assembly out loud as a message, it must, it must have an interpretation. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. So those are the two kinds of uh, tongues. And then the second kind of tongues, this ecstatic speech can be used in two ways. The first way is to use it as a prayer language. Right? I, th I think most of us here are probably well acquainted with using tongues as a prayer language. I pray in tongues all the time. It's a good way to edify oneself. And when you don't know what to pray and you feel the need to speak, you just speak in tongues. And there's edification to be had with that. So that's the first type of ecstatic speech. The second okay, is um, used as a vehicle 
uh, for a prophetic utterance. So it's used as a vehicle for a prophetic utterance. That is, that is that somebody during a time in the assembly can stand up and speak out a tongue that is not understood by the one speaking it and not understood by those who are around, but contains a prophetic message within it that requires an interpretation. So when a tongue is spoken and there is no interpretation, it could mean one of two things. One is that there's a prophetic word that nobody heard because they can't understand it. Or two, it was just simply somebody uh, who took their prayer language a little too far. All right, so 1 Corinthians 14. This is where we're going to start talking about this. The main point of the chapter is essentially this, to show that prophecy is greater than the gift of tongues. Okay? The prophecy is, a, is greater than the gift of tongues. Now listen to what Paul writes in the first five verses, 14. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, <laughs> for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So here's the key point here. Paul is putting understanding, Paul is putting prophecy in a higher place than tongues because it is understandable. It does not require an interpreter. It does not require a translation. It does not require a translator. In fact, when you go back to your passage in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, when it talks about the gifts, it says that they are for what? For the profit of all. Now, if you speak a tongue and there is no interpretation of the tongue, it is not for the profit of all. It is for the edification of the individual. Now, some have taken this to suggest that Paul was telling the church to stop speaking in tongues because prophecy is greater. Some have taken this to an extreme, which is not, which is not what Paul had meant at all. This whole thing, well, if prophecy is greater than tongues because prophecy can be understood, then, then we don't need tongues at all. Um, so we're just, don't speak in tongues anymore. But you see, the problem with that, the problem with this thinking is this, is if you go down, if you go down to the very end of the chapter, in chapter 14, Paul argues, says, therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, right? Because prophecy is good, it's the greater gift. And do not forbid to speak in tongues. So Paul is saying, he's not saying we're replacing the gift of tongues with prophecy. What we're actually doing is, is we're making prophecy greater, um, but we're not forbidding the gift of tongues because there is still value and the Holy Spirit still uses the gift of tongues to speak to his people. Now, when you look at this, hey, I, maybe you get some questions. Well, why would God use a gift of tongue if he could just use somebody to prophesy? And I'll just give you this answer. I don't know. Can I say that? Am I allowed to say that on the pulpit? I don't know. I don't know. It's a weird and wonderful gift. I love the gift of tongues. But there's other, other things in the scripture where, where you have to answer with, I don't know. Like you go, you go into uh, Revelation, uh, I think it's chapter 20, where it talks about Satan being bound. Uh, he gets thrown in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And, and, then, and then God opens the pit and lets Satan out. Right? Well, why does God let Satan out of the pit? I don't know. We can come up with some theories. The scriptures aren't exactly explicit on why. And I think it's the same thing here. <coughs> Excuse me. There's no explicit reason why Paul used, or why Paul, why God allows for the gift of tongues to operate in the church. But I do know one thing is that there is edification to be had. All right. So the necessity of interpretation. I think I'm really driving this point home. Um, but the reason why uh, is this, okay? We, again, we've had two incidents in our church where, where uh, there were tongues speak, uh, spoken out for the congregation to hear in a way that kind of gave us the, uh, the impetus that there might be a prophetic message attached to that, right? Remember, tongues interpreted as a prophetic message, okay? I was guilty of one of those, I will admit. I was wrong. 
Uh, I don't know if I was necessarily wrong to speak it, but I was uh, wrong in that there was no interpretation for it. Um, just like the other uh, uh, incident where it was spoken and there was no interpretation of it. Now, let's talk a little bit about that, right? I know it's, it's a little bit uncomfortable. It's okay. We're, we'll get through it. Um, but the interpretation, speaking in a tongue versus praying in a tongue, we talked about that. What we can do with the gift of tongues is one is to use it as a private prayer language. And I don't mean to say that you have to be locked away in a closet where nobody can hear you, right? If we're in a worship service and you're just worshiping the Lord and praying in tongues while you're worshiping, that this is not what we're talking about. Okay, what we're talking about is a, a purposeful speaking forth of a message for the congregation to hear in a, or in, in a way in which we assume there's a prophetic message attached to that. Again, if you're praying for somebody and, and we're all surrounded together and we're praying for somebody in the middle of a prayer circle and a few people are just kind of like praying to the Lord in tongues, that's not what we're talking about. Do that. Do that. I will encourage that. Man, if you, are, if you are worshiping the Lord and you feel the need to just pray in tongues while you're worshiping the Lord, do it. Okay, Pray in tongues. That's not what I'm talking about here. But if it goes quiet and there's, there's an opportunity to speak out what the Spirit is putting on your heart and you speak out a tongue out loud, it requires that interpretation. Now what, what does it mean? What does it mean to interpret? Now this is a really cool discussion. I'm a little bit over time, but uh, I hope you don't mind if I keep you just a little longer because this is key. What does it mean to interpret? What does it mean to really think about that? What does it mean to interpret? Interpret. Now there's <coughs> two words, two words in Greek that are very, very, very similar. The first one is herminevo, herminevo. The second word is the herminevo. It's the second word. There are two words slightly different with slightly different meanings. Okay, the passage that we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 14 does not use the word herminevo. Okay, it doesn't use that word, but it will help us to define it because we see this word herminevo used in three other passages in, in the New Testament. Okay, John chapter 1, 42 says, and he brought him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Okay, that's Herminevo, translated, Herminevo. And it's important to recognize that what he's doing here is the, the uh, narrator in the book of John. So John himself is recording that Jesus said he would be called Cephas, but Cephas is an Aramaic word. And the people who are reading John's gospel do not understand Aramaic. So you know what he does is he translates the words for the reader and says Cephas means a stone. And so when he's talking about this translation, he's using the word Herminevo. We see the same thing in John chapter 9, verse 7. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Again, same thing. Siloam is not a Greek word. It is an Aramaic word that is put into the Greek text and then translated by John so that his Greek readers would understand what he's saying. And then thirdly, as a third example of this word, Arminevo, Hebrews 7, 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated, Arminevo, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. So we see this word, Herminevo, used specifically for translating from one language into another. Translating the thought of one language into the thought of another. So that one can understand what the other one is saying. Now here's the interesting thing. 1 Corinthians 14 does not use that word. Paul could have used that word when he was addressing the Corinthians about the gift of tongues. But see, when it comes to the gift of tongues and interpretation, we are not talking about translating. We are not talking about translating. Think about that for a second. You'll, you'll see as we, we take a look at the second word why this is important. Diarminevo. And this is the word that's used by Paul when he talks about interpreting um, a, a spoken tongue. Luke 24, 27. It says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets... He expounded, 
He expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You know the story of the, uh, the two guys walking down the road and, and this guy joins them. They don't know that he's Jesus, but it's Jesus. And then they say, oh, haven't you heard of the things that have happened? And then all of a sudden this guy, he, he, he explains, he, he shares, he teaches, he expounds to them all the scriptures concerning the things that would happen to Jesus. So he's expounding, explaining, interpreting. It's not translation work. There's nothing to do with translation here. It's, it's interpretive. And again, we see this word diarminevo, though, sometimes used in the sense of translating. We see this word in Acts 9. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. Again, you take that Aramaic word translating into Dorcas. So there's a bit of overlap. And I think what happens here, and the reason why I'm sharing this is because this is what sometimes leads to a little bit of confusion. Right? We're not rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we, we take the one definition that we like the best and then we apply it to the passage. And we don't want to do that. We want to know, well, what is Paul saying? So understand this, that Paul, Paul could have used any word here in 1 Corinthians 14, but he chose, he chose to use the word that gives the explanation of interpretation. Interpretation. Okay, uh, so... Tongues are for edification. Use it in your prayer time with the Lord, but if you're going to speak it out for the congregation here, it must be followed up with an interpretation. Now, when you consider the difference between a translation and an interpretation, this is key, okay? I, I, you're you're going to go, ah, oh, I get it. Okay, listen. You ever, like, heard somebody speak a tongue out, and then there's this interpretation, right? And, and the person who spoke the tongues, he, he speaks what seems like, 30, 300 words in his tongue, but then when the interpretation comes, it's like 20 words. You ever see that mismatch? That's only a problem if you're translating. If we're told to translate, then that's a problem. But here's the thing. If he's interpreting, maybe the interpretation doesn't require as many words as was said in the tongue. Do you see the importance of that? You see how this is a work of interpretation and not a work of translation? Very cool. I saw that this week, and I was like, whoa, cool. I was so excited when I saw that. It made, made things so much clear. Um, but yeah, so here, I don't, I don't want to forbid tongues. I don't want to forbid tongues. We're not to forbid tongues. The Apostle Paul tells us not to forbid tongues. And I also don't want to fall into the other side, which is just like you can speak out a tongue to the congregation whenever you want. Paul, Paul regulates the use of tongues in the congregation. I, I typically don't like the word regulates. That involves like regulators and people getting into your business. You don't want to get into your business. It usually ends up costing you a lot of money. You know what I mean? Having a regulator come over and look at some stuff. We don't like that. But Paul regulates. And just like regulators in real life, they're, they're meant to prevent issues from happening down the road. They're meant to prevent issues from happening down the road. And the biggest issue with tongues speak when you speak it out and there's no interpretation is confusion. We don't want that confusion. You see in Acts 2, when there was that initial confusion, it gave way to marveling and amazement. We want that to happen. We want people to be like, what's going on? And then when they realize what's going on, that's the Lord speaking, that they would be amazed and edified. Now, I want to talk really quickly about an interesting part of this passage in 1 Corinthians 14. I don't have it in my notes, uh, so just bear with me while I flip over to the passage here, my Bible. All right, there it is, 1 Corinthians 14, 13, on interpretation. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Now listen to that for a second. I, th I think we kind of mixed up the model here. And I think if I were to go back and kind of do a deep dive into what happened in those two instances where there were no, where there were no interpretations, this is I, I don't think we properly set the expectation that when you speak a tongue, you're responsible for its interpretation. I mean, let me say that again. When you speak a tongue, you're responsible for the interpretation the whole um, idea of speaking a tongue and then waiting for somebody else to interpret, I would, I would suggest that we wait, but if there is no one else to interpret the tongue, then it falls on you as an individual. Yes, yes, I get it. That can be scary. That can be scary. But listen to what Paul says. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. That he may interpret. Pray 
If the Lord puts it on your heart to speak a tongue in this time where the congregation is listening and you think this tongue is, is uh, filled with some sort of prophecy and, and nobody is speaking, then you need to pray and it will be left up to someone like Pastor Blair up here to leave time for this sort of thing to happen. You would pray and ask the Lord for the interpretation and then you would speak that interpretation. And I think that's how it goes. We're, we're not to just kind of guess if someone in the congregation has the interpretation. And I think that's what happened in these, uh, these two instances. Um, so I, going forward, I think that's a better model um, for stewarding the gift of tongues. So we'll roll with that for a little bit and we'll see how that, how that goes. All right. Now, I don't want to forbid tongues. Okay. So how do we respond if someone speaks in a tongue and there is no interpretation? How do we respond if someone speaks in a tongue and there is no interpretation? This is really important because I suspect that this may happen a few times still. So here's what we do. First thing, Christian, brother and sister in the Lord, you have received a tremendous amount of grace and mercy from the Lord. So let's have a tremendous amount of grace and mercy on the individual who took the courage to speak when they thought the Holy Spirit was prompting them to speak. So let's have grace and mercy with this individuals. Okay, we're not gonna jump to conclusions. We don't wanna jump to conclusions, say that was demonic. Okay, we don't wanna jump to conclusions, say they're not hearing from the Lord. Maybe they did, and maybe someone just didn't interpret. Maybe they did. We don't wanna jump to conclusions. Okay, we wanna think the best. We wanna think the best of our brother and sister in Christ. And, and you know what, here's the thing is, is I, I learned this lesson last time I spoke in tongues. It could happen to you. It could happen to you. And you know what, we are gonna have the same grace and mercy with you if it happens to you. We don't wanna set up an environment here where people are scared to operate in the gifts because they feel they're gonna be judged by their brother and sister in Christ. That is also a no-no. That's the opposite of edification. You know what? If somebody fails at one of the gifts, that's an opportunity to edify that person. Amen? Amen. All right. It's really easy to judge those who speak a tongue that is spoken. Uh, it's a lot more difficult. Okay, listen to this. It's a lot more difficult to judge an individual who received an unction to speak a tongue in the Holy Spirit but didn't. Okay, think about that. The person who speaks is opening themselves up to potential judgment, right? This is why we have grace and mercy with them. They're opening themselves up to a little bit of ridicule, right? If they get it wrong, right? They might be a little bit embarrassing. I get it. I get it. But listen, it's better than the person who receives the unction, but doesn't speak it for fear of people. One, because we don't know that that happened. You keep it hidden down, hidden deep down, so nobody knows that that happened. You see, the Lord knows, the Lord knows. So that, that too needs just as much grace and mercy as the person who speaks a tongue and there's no interpretation for it. So here's what I would say to the individual who receives the unction but doesn't speak it. Share that with a trusted believer. Seriously, share that with a believer. Because this is what's going to happen. That person, right, that you're sharing that with is going to encourage you to, to take that, to pray about it, to take it to the Lord. And then when the Lord has you do it again, he will give you more courage. You will be edified. You will be built up. Your courage will be built up just by the simple act of sharing how you missed that. Because here's the thing. When somebody speaks a tongue, we can go and talk to them and see what happened. And they'll be more open to talk because I'm sure it's embarrassing and all these things. But, but the person who receives the unction but doesn't give it, right? we don't know. We can't come to you and help you unless you say something. So I would encourage you to say something. If we come down too harshly, okay, listen, we run the risk of quenching the Spirit. And we do not want to quench the Spirit. We do not want to quench the Spirit. All right, so let's, let's, uh, let's conclude here. And I've gone on a lot longer than I anticipated. Um, but the, the last question is, why does God use the gift of tongues? Why does God use the gift of tongues? Paul says we edify ourselves when we use it as a prayer language and when we use it in the sense of speaking a prophetic word that is interpreted, we edify the church. We edify the church. It's meant for edification. It's a beautiful, beautiful gift. Now, I can think of times in my own life that I have been anxious about something, uh, even recently, okay, only for it to be alleviated by a short time praying in tongues. It builds you up. 
It relieves you of your anxieties. It brings you closer to God. You ever notice when you're speaking of tongues, you can think about the wonderful works of God. You can think about the gift of Jesus and how he died for your sins and rose from the dead. And uh, the gift of tongues, sometimes you get the warm and fuzzies. Okay, the warm and fuzzies are good. Okay, they're good. We're not going to base doctrine off it. And we're not going to like base all these things, but it's good to feel. And you will, as a Christian who is moved by the Holy Spirit, you will feel something. You have to. It's like, uh, I like Paul Washer, and he would cringe at me using this for the gift of tongues because he's a cessationist, but I'm going to use it anyway. In one of his sermons, he preaches about how like, you know, meeting, meeting with Jesus, right? As a sinner who finally gets confronted with a sin, he meets with Jesus and, uh, and it changes his life because it's like getting hit by a Mack truck and nobody who is hit by a Mack truck walks away unscathed. You don't walk away unscathed. You walk away changed forever. So when Jesus, when Jesus comes to you and meets you, he hits you like that Mack truck and changes you forever. There's going to be an emotional response to that. There has to be. How many times you look in scripture when somebody is confronted with, with an angel Right, this crazy supernatural power. They have they have this emotional response of fear, or when they're when they're confronted with with a vision of of God and and you know how he puts the eyes over. I think it's Moses or Elijah. I can't remember. And he just kind of sees the back part of his his uh, his thing there, and and like he's filled with this awe and wonder. This, this is a very emotional experience. Romans chapter eight verse sixteen quantifies this emotional experience this way. It says. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You know how I see that? The only way that I think we can really see that is that there is an emotional, spiritual connection between you and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is bringing comfort. He's bringing comfort to you, saying that you are a child of God. You are a child of God. It's a very emotional thing. When the Holy Spirit moves in someone, there will be an emotional response. This gift of tongues will normally be associated with an emotional response. It does not mean that it's going to be a wild emotional response all the time, but it's one of those things. It's meant for edification. It edifies yourself. Pray in tongues. If you have the gift of tongues, use it. Use it. You will be blessed and edified and alleviated of a whole sort, a whole assortment of issues. So use the gift that God had given you. So I think that's a good place to stop. Went a little bit over time, but let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for your gift. Thank you for your gift of tongues, Lord. Help us, Lord, to use this gift as you have given it to us, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would help us to steward this gift well. We pray that we would see people in this church who, who just pray out in tongues, seeking you, Lord Jesus, in our times of worship, Lord. And even when we go home and we're alone with you, Lord, that we would use this gift that you have so given to us. Lord, we thank you for the gift of tongues. We bless you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.